Thank you, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to this intriguing workshop and to try and set the scene for our discussions this afternoon. I'm going to largely be reading my script uh, given our strange circumstances, uh, and I hope you can bear with me. Now, Dublin in 1720 was already much the largest city in the country, and it was also far larger than any provincial city in England. It had been growing inexorably but unevenly for more than a century, recovering surprisingly rapidly from the disasters of the 1640s and from the social upheavals during the Jacobite Williamite War. Dublin, since the early 1600s, had moved from being a town of wood and cage work to a city of brick and to what that extent of stone, although this was a transition no means complete by 1720. But the new face of the city was evident everywhere, uh, most obviously uh, along the quays and the adjacent commercial streets. And reclamation plans both north and south of the Liffey were nothing if not ambitious at that stage. Now we all tend to see the Dublin of this era through the eyes of, or rather the writings of Jonathan Swift. His influence on how we imagine Dublin in the 1720s is profound and his scabrous, if not scatological view of the city, its follies, its corruption, and the poverty of his neighbours was, of course, embedded in his wider, pervasive negative commentary on Irish society as a whole. And Swift was, of course, not alone in painting a profoundly depressing picture of the state of Ireland uh, during the 1720s, when most of his writings on Ireland occur. Now, the that decade was indeed a time of severe economic turbulence, starting in 1720, as Patrick will be revealing in a few minutes. But if first we stand back a little, we can see that the city had come a long way in 100 years, even in the 30 years since the Battle of the Boyne, uh, even if this growth may at times have been in spite of, rather than because of the economic improvement across Ireland as a whole. Some then, some later, believed Dublin's early 18th century advance was entirely at the expense of other places, of other towns and cities, perhaps even of the countryside at large. Now, our other key witness at this point in history is Charles Brooking. His great map of the city was published in 1728, and it included vignettes of the chief public buildings, including uh, this hospital, plus uh, a great panoramic view across the city from the north side. We have here what purports to be the first street map of the city, suggesting remarkable new developments around the perimeter uh, of the city. Now, Brooking may at times be as treacherous a guide as Swift, but it's true that a lot was happening, and there's no disputing the impact of Brooking's friend, possibly his patron, uh, Surveyor General Thomas Berg. Um, that he'd been having really since 1700 as architect and part overseer of the huge new custom house on Essex Quay, uh, the workhouse beside James Street, the great library building in Trinity College, the enormous linen hall of Bolton Street, the great basin also up in James Street area, and most spectacular of all, the complex of military buildings that constituted the Royal Barracks just north of the river. Uh, and of course, he also designed this hospital and was one of the first trustees. All of these buildings were very large projects by Dublin standards, although the hospital here was perhaps more of a pet project, archaic in its design to the modern eye, uh, to the unlettered eye anyway, it was his most atmospheric creation. Now, Berg was therefore critical in the transformation of the Dublin skyline during the first three decades of uh, the 18th century. His buildings were very visible, uh, very visible evidence of the, the process of state building and are strong muscular expressions of the capacity of, post of the post-Williamite Protestant establishment to run the city and the country. It may have lacked the architectural sophistication or pretensions of later public buildings, but Berg did change the feel of the city with these great edifices in stone, which were more substantial and more visible uh, than any of the uh, cities, cathedrals, or churches. Nevertheless, uh, this was also a time 
of church, of small church building, a process instigated by the ever active Church of Ireland Archbishop William King. During his long episcopate between 1703 and 1729, he'd overseen the construction of some nine parish churches in the city, an achievement that perhaps even Archbishop McQuaid might have been impressed by. Certainly there was never again a Protestant church building program in the city to match this. And then from the 1720s, the center and Catholic church building was also beginning in earnest. So King's particular commitment to church building and to parish restructuring is a, a clue to something that I want to touch on now, that Dublin, his Dublin, was predominantly a Protestant city, perhaps more decisively so than at any stage before or since. True, the Catholic population was larger and more polychrome than appearances suggest, um, but it was only really in the 1720s that Catholic church activity was once again in evidence, now that the intermittent harassment of Catholic church, clergy was becoming a thing of the past, in the city at least. Visible wealth in Dublin was largely, not exclusively, Protestant, and while there were substantial numbers of minor Catholic gentry within the Pale, in Dublin itself, those who drove the large coaches and who entertained them most extravagantly were Protestant landed gentry or Protestant lawyers. Some of it was old money, much of it new. Um, the great William Connolly, lawyer, land speculator, politician and office holder, epitomized the emergence of a, a new group of power brokers about to enter his seventh decade. He was now planning, of course, the vast palace and castle time. But the Connolly family was city-based and his great house at the top of Capel Street remained one of the focal points for upper-class sociability. There were not many great houses in the city in 1720, just a few along Jervis Street and Mary Street, a few along Dame Street and on Stephen's Green. At this stage, many of the members of the Irish Parliament uh, only rented a Dublin house uh, for a relatively short period before uh, or during uh, the time the Parliament sat. There were, however, growing numbers of office-holding families, lawyers, soldiers, clerics, who were a permanent presence in the city. Medics were generally less prominent than their successors were to be a century later. Most of the physicians and surgeons active in the 1720s had north side addresses, near to their generally wealthier clients. Uh, Dr. Stevens, Patrick Dunn, Edward Worth were, I think, unusual among their peers in earning sufficient income to be able to invest in in property, be it land or books. Uh, and we can compare the small medical profession with the relatively affluent higher clergy of the Church of Ireland on and off the bench who lived in the city. Thus, Dean Swift's financial capacity, capacity to fund his hospital up the road is perhaps less surprising than the achievement of Stevens and his sister. Although remember that the fathers of both uh, the Stevens and Dr. Worth were clergymen too. Now, visitors to early 18th century Dublin were struck by its physical similarities with London, albeit on a much smaller scale. And this was partly because much of the urban fabric in both places was quite new. Partly, of course, also because London and Dublin were what we call court cities, where businesses and services were heavily geared towards satisfying the needs of the officers of state and those otherwise involved in administration, law, state security, plus, of course, the great landowners, for the most part, very wealthy consumers, whether they were occasional or full-time residents. And in all such court cities, here and on the continent, the presence of conspicuous consumers attracted vast numbers of poor migrants who came in search of manual, unregulated employment. And the majority of migrants to Dublin and in the 1720s were young, and women seeking domestic service, young men seeking employment outside the regular trades in construction, food and drink preparation, street selling, carting uh, and portrait. Some of these settled, some came seasonally, many only appeared in times of hardship in the countryside. Uh, such migrants were, I think, usually single uh, and at least initially unmarried. Here in Dublin, there were complaints that the vagabond youth of both sexes were flooding the city, hiding in cellars or stables, protected by older migrants who put down roots. But in most years, there was an abundance of unskilled employment available, not least in the great building projects around the town. Now, another symptom of this kind of migration was something new to Dublin, but it had a lot, was to have a long history. 
tenements. The first references to tenements appear in this era, indicating that larger houses were being divided up in, in, into smaller tenancies. Nearly all the early references to tenements relate to secondary streets north of the river and close to the city markets. Uh, we know that in St. Michael's Parish in 1723, the mean household size was already 12 persons per house. And a little later, Arthur Dobbs claimed that in some houses, quote, in the trading part of the city, there were families in every room, oftentimes on each floor and in the cellars. Now, we know very little about the poor migrants of this era beyond the fear and resentment they evoked among more settled citizens following bad harvests or when there was outbreaks of epidemic fever. When the visibility of beggars on the streets be certainly became far more uh, pervasive. Yet the continued flow of cheap labour into the Dublin was critical. As has been said of uh, other cities at other times, it has always been, quote, the common fate of the poor migrant to make the city work without ever quite belonging to it. Now, Dublin could only maintain its numbers if it continued to attract migrants. This was true in all the industrial cities, emphatically so, I think, here in early 18th century Dublin, when the death rate among young people was much higher than in rural Ireland, and when the scourge, particularly of smallpox, led to soaring levels of child mortality. Children aged 15 and under made up over half of all recorded deaths in Dublin in this era, reaching in some years uh, over 60% of all mortality. Uh, that did improve, uh, but only really uh, in the last third of the 18th century. So I'm emphasizing that Dublin was a, uh, remaining a city of migrants. Now, there were several distinct migrant streams replenishing and increasing its population. We can surmise that the unskilled were overwhelmingly drawn from within the province of Leinster, Wicklow, Kildare, and these probably the most important. But what about those with skills and capital who uh, came? Were they from further afield? Well, the most famous such certainly were the great Huguenot immigration, so important to the city at the turn of the century, had brought in both well-to-do military pensioners and poor craftspeople from provincial France, most of them via a sojourn uh, in England. Now, this inflow had largely ended by 1720, so that the Huguenot element was being slowly absorbed within the city's Protestant communities, Anglican and dissenter. And those Protestant communities themselves were, of course, descended from earlier English and Dutch settlers, some of whom had come directly to Dublin from across the water, like Dr. Stevens' parents or Patrick Dunn, but most of them arrived via rural or military experience elsewhere in Ireland. But by, 20, by 1720, that was really no longer the pattern. In the handful of trade guilds for which we have records, it seems that apprentices were now overwhelmingly being recruited locally or at least from within Leinster. The case of the goldsmith. In the 17th century, less than half had Dublin fathers, whereas in the 18th century, two thirds of all goldsmith and silversmith apprentices were Dubliners, with other Leinster counties contributing a further 20%. Now, the proportion may have been lower in less prestigious guilds, um, but I think by the 1720s, uh, Dublin's craft population, like the poorer general labourers, were Irish-born, probably Leinster-born, and, and then while the wholesale merchant community was somewhat more diverse in its origins, the workshop world was now much less so. 1720s also mark the first signs of conflict within the workshop between masters and journeymen, principally over terms of employment, controls on apprenticeship, and access into the craft. Journeyman clubs make their first appearance uh, at this time, a product perhaps of the sharp swings in employment during the troubled uh, 20s, but also a sign of the growing economic distance between masters and the many journeymen who'd served their time but lacked the resources to move directly to become independent masters themselves. Now, most of the early conflicts were in textile manufacturing or in the related clothing trades. And of course, textiles made up a huge proportion of craft employment in the city, at least a third. And even though the small workshop, with a handful of apprentices living with the master's family, and a few wage earning journeymen residing elsewhere, while well, that was the norm, this pattern was beginning to change with, a, with small clusters of masters expanding their business, enlarging their work, workshops, and diversifying into other activities, while others lost status and economic leverage. 
I think Karl Marx would have understood what was uh, underway. Now, from the time of the statutory establishment of governors to oversee this hospital, its declared mission was to bring about the recovery of poor, decayed housekeepers, tradesmen, and laborers. Elizabeth Ann will be saying a great deal more about the foundation presently, but several things strike me about this self-imposed remit of the trustees. In other words, craftspeople uh, seem to be uh, uh, yeah, uh, tradesmen were another term for the crafts. But why poor, decayed tradesmen? Why that term? Well, it was an almost standard formulation intended to exclude families of substance, merchants, etc. But it was also recognition of the seesaw economic fortunes of almost everyone engaged in workshop employment. Demand was never constant and family poverty and need a recurring phenomenon. So it's not completely out of place to talk about the, the, the poor and the decayed. Most went through a stage of that. Secondly, I think it's worth noting there was no specification as to the religious affiliation in that mission statement, either in relation to the trustees or to those eligible for medical care in the future. The much smaller but slightly earlier charitable infirmary established on Cook Street had also no ostensible religious connotations. And yet, most, if not all, of its surgeons uh, and one or two physicians were Catholic. Uh, it's notable that Archbishop King's Catholic contemporary, Archbishop Fagan, left the charitable infirmary a small bequest. Whereas all of those associated with governance and management of Dr. Stevens were Protestants, headed at the beginning by King himself. Yet I think to see the two institutions as denominational rivals at that stage would be quite anachronistic. We cannot be sure, but it's worth remembering that the principal catchment area for the charitable infirmary uh, would have been the oldest Riverside streets around Cook Street and on the north side, the markets area. In other words, the least Protestant neighborhoods of the city. Whereas Dr. Stevens Hospital seems to have primarily served the workshop world of the Mead Liberties. And as long as the manufacture of silk and of fine woolens were thriving, say up to the 1760s, the Meath Liberties retained a distinctive Protestant character. Its artisanal residents, literate, perhaps often a bit untamed, building a reputation for recreational violence, thinking of the Liberty Boys, first evident in the 1720s, though just why then is unclear. But finally, let me step back a decade to Dr. Richard Stevens himself, about whom we know so tantalizingly little. His final illness late in 1710 must have come, up, come on him quickly, as apparently he only made his famous will the day before he died. And we know that the rural property that was left to endow his planned hospital had only been purchased over the previous 18 months, a time of war, trade paralysis, and harvest failure, when money was scarce and property prices depressed. The terrible European winter of 1708-09, coming in the midst of international war, had affected even Ireland, forcing up food prices, forcing up food prices to record levels, and bringing about the first recorded food riot in Irish history, in Cork. So one wonders whether a wave of local suffering here in 1709-1710 may have been the catalyst for Richard Stevens' remarkable act of philanthropy the maimed soldiers returning from the Duke of Marlborough's battles, uh, not, they were not the primary issues. After all, they could now be accommodated in the ample quarters of the Royal Hospital. But what of the collateral victims of war and famine? Perhaps, as with other 18th century uh, medical philanthropic initiatives, like the uh, lying in hospital, the Rotunda, the Hospital for Incurables, uh, the Cork Street Fever Hospital, Perhaps it took a crisis and a wave of sickness and suffering on the streets to make things happen, leading to this and to subsequent great medical institutions, perhaps. Thank you.